Hey guys, it's MJ and I did an interview with a really cool startup called Pineapple. They are a peer-to-peer -peer insurance platform. Um, unfortunately though, when I did the interview it was over Skype and the internet connection wasn't the best. So the audio quality is not great. So what I have done is I've added subtitles. So make sure to turn on the subtitles if you're battling to hear what they're saying. But without further ado, let's jump straight into this. Thanks guys. So we are, we, we are recording and I just want to say thank you guys so much for, I mean, taking time out of your busy schedule to, to do this interview. Um, but I know it's something that a lot of people have been requesting on my, my channel is, you know, can actuaries become entrepreneurs? Uh, so that's why I was very excited when, when I came across your guys' article and I was like, ah, oh, fantastic. Because... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I believe it's, it's, it's Matthew who's, who's studying actuarial science, or who, who studied actuarial science. Yeah, so I studied that. Okay, fantastic. And, and the other guys, what, what are your backgrounds? So, my background is in auditing and law. Mm -hmm. uh, and my background is in accounting and tax. But then I did a 180 and Okay, fantastic. I mean, that's like the, the best combination, is to have an actuary, a lawyer, and an accountant kind of all working together because those are kind of like the three big spheres when it comes to, to doing business and stuff. Um, yeah, it's really a mix of skills. Yes, yes. But before we get into the whole thing, I just want to ask Matthew very quickly because um, this is a question I get asked quite a, quite a lot as well. So I'm interested in your answer is why did you study actuarial science? <laughs> No, yes, Stephen was was a brilliant lecturer. I, I must say, I do yeah. I do miss miss him. But I mean, the one thing about studying actuarial science is that it does come with this very lucrative salary at the end of uh, every month if you do work for for one of the big companies. So, what made you decide to to turn your back on that and rough it out as an entrepreneur? So, I mean, I did work for one in terms of insurance prior to doing this. But I've always had an affinity for new technology, new things, what's happening, startup, culture. And so I've always tried to keep myself busy doing side projects that could be considered entrepreneurial. So when this competition came along, I decided to apply and the rest is history, I guess. And so would you say that this is your, your first startup or have you guys or other people in your team worked on other little projects maybe say at school um, or at, during university or is this the first time you guys are doing the whole you know, entrepreneurial startup thing? No, I think all of us have you know, had side projects in the past, just small things that we've worked on here and there um, that we all geared towards that. But this is definitely the most formal and uh, so far the biggest, I guess. <laughs> And, and tell me, um, I mean, you guys have called yourself Pineapple. Um, whose idea was that and like, what, what's the story behind that name? Cool. So, there's actually quite an interesting story behind it. So, uh, Pineapple, the fruit, is uh, what not a lot of people know is that it's not a single fruit. Each of the knobs on a pineapple is actually an individual berry. Oh. And all those berries come together to help protect each other. And we, we saw the similarity in insurance to that, where a lot of people come together to help protect the individual. Okay, that's actually pretty pretty interesting, because I thought it was like, oh, you know, there's blackberry, there's apple, so we're like, <laughs> let's just call ourselves after a fruit, you know, that, that seems to be the, the trend. Okay, so, so we actually, yeah. we originally named Amity, mm -hmm. it was a, a story about that where you know, we had quite set on that name, and identity work for us and then all of a sudden one day we decided hey let's just go check the trademark you know category and lo and behold there was an amity that was trademarked a bit of a different spelling that still was going to be a problem mm -hmm. so we were sort of forced to change the name and it was quite a big exercise we had about 300 suggestions of potential names and pineapple we didn't like it first but that's one out of there Okay. You know, I must say, it's, it, I think it's that, that story of the pineapple, it, it's, 
it's quite a lovely story in the sense that it's something that I didn't know about. I mean, I eat this stuff all the time, and, and I wasn't even aware of it. So, so no, that, that is great. But now, tell me guys, can you explain your idea in a nutshell? So very quickly, what, what exactly does pineapple do? So pineapple is a peer-to-peer -peer insurer. Um, so, I mean, our core focus and the reason why we in existence is to increase the value that the consumer gets from their short-term insurance policy. And to do this, we, there's a couple of factors that we needed to address. So the first one was, is a lot of fraud in insurance. You know, that makes up around 38% of claims values are fraudulent. Um, the second factor was there's high expenses. Higher than there technically needs to be when you think of all the technology and distribution channels available today. Mm -hmm. And then there's, in some cases, very excessive profit margins, um, underrunning profit from insurance. And so we try to think of a model that would tackle these three things that diminish value in order to increase value for the consumer. So the, the, the three things are that we try to do at Pineapple is introduce transparency into insurance, into reintroduce affinity into insurance, and finally introduce or remove that conflict of interest that's currently existing in insurance. And by that we mean that the way that the insurance business model is set up is that they keep all the profit that's left over on the claims. And from a consumer's perception, this is, you know, this is obviously a conflict of interest whereby for every claim they deny they are profiting. And that's how consumers fear it and they end up mistrusting insurers, which leads to fraud. Okay, okay. And and tell me, I mean, I, I see something something that was also a peer to peer insurance company was set up in, in 2010 called Friendsurance. Is, is Pineapple like a, a clone of that or is it something different? So, uh, just on the me exact mechanics of Pineapple, so as you probably know, we still in stealth mode, so we're not, not disclosing the exact mechanics of what we're doing. But in terms of Friendsurance, you can expect uh, something completely new that hasn't been seen worldwide. So, it's not a layer that's built on top of the traditional insurance. It's a complete revamp of the whole value chain. Okay, cool. So let's just, I know you guys are in stealth mode and you don't want to talk too much about how the processes work. But I was reading an article where you guys were talking about using the Mango, DB and React Native. And can I ask, why did you choose those technologies over something like Ionic and Firebase? So the um, number one reason why we went to React Native is because uh, we wanted to make sure that the Pineapple application is as accessible to a large number of devices as possible. So the benefit of uh, React Native is that from one code base, you can port the device out to both iOS uh, operating system as well as our Android operating system. And uh, in terms of our choice of uh, MongoDB, I'm sure you have the way MongoDB is a, is a, a NoSQL database. Mm -hmm. It's unstructured. So uh, the benefit that we give to that is that um, we're able to pass data and um, create the database much faster and much more efficiently. Our, our number one goal is to make uh, very good use of data. Okay. We're going to be collecting a lot of social data that, uh, quite frankly, you know, has, has not been used in shows. So we need to be able to create that data and uh, make good use of that data at very good and um, efficient speeds. And, and tell me, I, I hear, so you guys want to go on both Android and, and Apple. Um, I mean, I've, exactly. I've just tried to, to release an app and Android was, you know, like no problem, you know, put whatever you want on this, on this app store. But with, with Apple, they, they rejected my app. They were like, oh, you know, it doesn't meet these guidelines and it goes, infringes this. And I actually went and I read their guidelines and it's, it's quite a long, lengthy document. Does Pineapple infringe on any of, of Apple's, um, you know, business conditions, or is this something that will we'll get the green light from, from them? Yeah, so um, we've gone through um, the Apple requirements to put the application onto the store, and uh, Pineapple fits in perfectly within that, the regulation, so um, we won't have any problems in getting the application out there. Okay, cool. And then um, another question just around from the, the, the technical side. Um, and there's like a lot of hype around this whole thing known as blockchain and I was seeing some of your articles 
you guys mentioned that you you know you were looking at that as a technology would you ever consider releasing an ICO you know these things that have popped up on the internet that have raised stupid amounts of money yeah yeah so I mean it's definitely something we have looked at um, it's a very obviously attractive thing anyone who follows blockchain and produce there will see how attractive it is for a startup to release an ICO but in some ways that ICO market is becoming very crowded and also it's becoming less trustworthy so uh, that's more of just a ploy for people who just make obscene amounts of money very quickly in some cases and not true startups so I mean it, it definitely is something we may, might consider one day but right now we just wait for the venture capital route okay fantastic and and just just to talk more more on the finance side I see you guys raised 5.2 million rand and I also saw that Lemonade which is also like a tech insurance company they were able to raise 13 million dollars from actually a guy who studied actuarial science at UCT, Rulof Bertha with, with his capital um, company in Silicon Valley. What made you guys go for 5.2 million rand and not for some stupid silly you know 100 million like other companies have done? And look, you, you guys don't have to answer this, this next question, but just roughly speaking, what is that 5.2 million going towards? Like, what is the budget? Is it mainly going towards salaries? You know, you're going to hire a whole bunch of support staff. Is it going towards technology? Is it going towards trying to get over regulatory barriers? Is it support staff? Um, what, what is your... Yeah, the uh, majority of it is going towards technology. So we see technology, as we said before, the, the idea was we need to implement a new business model that can operate a lot cheaper and have and remove the conflicts of interest. So we changed the whole business model really. And the technology is the delivery vehicle for that business model. So I mean we all know that all insurance companies are gonna have applications and some already do and, uh, but our application we want it to be beautiful, we want it to be seamless. And we want the, the experience to be frictionless as well. Because if you're delivering something you, you have to have the best possible delivery vehicle for it. So we, we we're really going, you know, above and beyond when it comes to the technology and trying to get it perfect. So yeah, a large part of the funding is for the technology and uh, the build of a lot of the systems in the background as well, and also like marketing costs and operational costs. Okay, cool. And now, I mean, if if we move now more into say the the actual product that you guys are are doing, the fact that it's peer to peer insurance is this something that I can approach? solo Let, let's say my, my family uh, so let, let's say for instance my family they very got close ties with their brokers and even though i studied actuarial science and i can find their much cheaper premiums elsewhere they're like no no the broker he's like a family friend we've been with him for 30 years there's no way we're moving to to something cheaper um can i come to you guys as an individual or do i need to come with my entire friend group so michael yeah that's a great question i'm actually very happy you asked because that's something that we've designed our model to be completely flexible and scalable in that way where you can come as an individual, not be connected to anyone, you don't have to have an initial group or anything and get the same benefits um, and just be part of the system for this new business model. Um, and that's exactly how we designed the whole thing is to accommodate individuals as well as groups and you can slowly build up your network as you like and that's uh, quite a change from how Okay, and then I mean, just just from like say a regulatory point of view, are you guys going to be an insurance company? Are you going to be a broker? Do you have any underwriting relationships? Are you going to go through somebody else's license, set up a captive? I mean, this is more of a a technical actuarial question, but how are you guys going to be seen from a, a regulatory point of view? That, that's actually a very good question. So when we started this journey, we we tried to find 
spot where the intuitive actually should fit. And well, not that surprising, uh, a regulatory model hasn't really been created for where an intuitive should really sit. So what we've done is we've incorporated as an FSP um, just to cover our base and we'll be operating as a digital FSP. And then um, we've, from our research, one thing that we've really found that the insurers do very well is that the, the capital management, the use of the capital is actually super efficient. And that's due to the fact that they've got a broad geographical spread of risk and they've got a huge variety of risk. So for us to try and build up our own capital budgets, especially in the peer-to-peer model, wouldn't really be fit to the consumer because he's getting the most bang for his buck. So what we've done is we've partnered with Compass Insurance and we're writing on their paper. And the simple reason for that is that uh, a large insurer will always have capital efficiencies over someone who's trying to set up its own capital. Well, well, this is the one thing that, that I do find quite interesting about these these peer-to-peer insurance systems. The, the idea is that you, you almost pay, you pay a big premium because a chunk of that premium goes towards the reserve. And if not enough claims are made, then that premium then gets refunded back to the person. Is there not a way to make it so that you make that premium a little bit lower and you just let the people take on a little bit additional risk or do you think that's not something that the market is is ready for so what I mean by that is a completely isolated system where you you're putting your money onto this platform and if there's no more money at the end of the day you know you still suffer your risk so it, it could be considerably more cheaper but considerably more more riskier do you think that's something sure. that we're not ready yeah, for that's, that's an interesting topic I mean it's definitely something that we did explore along the way and there are I can't think of the names now, but I can give it to you later. There are only one or two companies that do do it that way. But what we found is, you know, it's, it's one thing to charge an excess on a claim and make you take a bit of the heat of a, a, a amount which you're comfortable with and you know up front. But can you really feel comfortable having your house insured, your car insured, especially for third party liabilities when you're not exactly sure that there's going to be enough money in the system to cover your claim? And that's Mm-hmm. That's really where we sort of drew the line and said, well, I don't, you know, you can do that, but all people really substitute a full indemnified insurance policy for something along those lines. And our conclusion that we came to was no, that weren't. And so what we've built actually gives you fully indemnified insurance cover that has a reinsurance component, so your claims will always get paid. Okay. But it's in a peer-to-peer format, in a completely decentralized way. Because I mean, that, that's always the, I think the scariest thing about insurance um, or setting up an insurance company is you might be selling cover to somebody who's got you know a very old Toyota, and then one day they they create a pile up with a you know a bunch of Ferraris, and you've got this massive this massive claim that could wipe out out the system. So it's great to hear that you guys have got those reinsurance um, burial that reinsurance layer of protection. But I want to just ask from, let's say, from a process point of view, how would that look? Let's say I, I crash my car into a Ferrari. I come to your guys' app and I say, I crashed into a Ferrari. How, how do you guys know that it was a Ferrari that I crashed into and say, not just another random car? What, where's that? Like, yo, how do you solve that process? So there is some validation on the claim side that we've built in. And there's also some models we're using there. But the whole... Very much in what the way we structured everything is from the use of behavioral economics. Mm-hmm. So something I forgot to tell you about minus is actually a bit of a behavioral economics windy. And uh, along the lines of everything, the idea is how do we change this perception of insurance and that people don't hate insurance because currently they do. They feel like they're paying their premiums into a black hole. They feel it's socially acceptable to commit fraud. And this is like a, a problem which just participates in insurance over and over again. So, yeah, in terms of that, there is things that we, we're doing on the broad side from an analysis point of view, but also from a behavioral point of view, because the way in which we've set up the model is we're not benefiting by denying the claim, and the people who are affected most by the claim that you bring in are the people you're connected with. Mm-hmm. And you benefit most by actually saying, not, well, you, you benefit most by what 
And also, the, we have a company called Growling who have years and years experience in dealing with these sorts of claims, especially when it comes to third party liability legal sort of issues. And they're helping us along the same side. And then tell me, uh, some insurance companies, what they do is they sometimes they, they make a little bit of a an operating loss on their premium. But what they do is that they take their premium money and they invest it and they're able to cover up that loss with investment income. Are you guys going to be, or, or you don't have to answer this if, if it's still in stealth mode, but will you guys be investing that, the premiums that people uh, put forward and how would you be investing that money? No, no, that's 100% um, fine because I know that is quite a, that's like a trade secret with a lot of insurance companies. So, so no worries with that. Um, I'll tell you what, let's, let's wrap it off with, with two last questions. Um, the last one will be, you know, how do people actually sign up to this, this pineapple and, and get involved? But before we get to that one, um, can you just tell us what's next for pineapple? What is the, what is the roadmap? What's the five year plan? I mean, are you guys going to try to take on the world or do you want to just be the best in say South Africa? What is, what's the ambition? Yeah, so, um, firstly, uh, I must uh, state that our goal is to go to market uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and if you want to go to market with, uh, selling insurance for all risk products such as your laptop, cell phone, sports equipment. Uh, our goal for next year is to introduce the Lotus insurance product um, to our own Q2, Q3, 2018. We want to actually start selling Lotus products through the application. Uh, there's some very really interesting um, applications and the Pineapple app in itself too. So for instance, um, my island, we've started talking to uh, people who are in line with the Tucker form. Um, insurance product and uh, this is this is an insurance product that's compliant with the Muslim Sharia law and uh, the way we set up the pineapple um, mechanism is that it links itself well to um, working uh, with the type of um, your, uh, insurance product so that's a very interesting route that we're, we're exploring. Uh, we've also been talking to a lot of representatives from insurance companies and other um, emerging markets and um, they are very interested in the concept and uh, just, um, how it works. So uh, I will say that from now we want to prove that it works in South Africa. We want to make sure that the technology is seamless and that it's stable. And uh, once once that's done, um, we will definitely keep on rolling out. Okay, awesome. And then yeah, I guess let's let's end off with say um, how do people so the people listening here. Um, I'm going to put a link in the description below to your guys' website. But what is their process for them to to sign up with you guys? So um, firstly, uh, I must state that. Uh, have a website, pineapple.co.za, mm -hmm. and uh, on that website, uh, you'll find the feed where we can actually join the queue to get any access um, to the application. And uh, once you join the queue, you're able to track where exactly you are in terms of your position on that queue. So you can see how many people are ahead of you, as well as how many people are behind you. Okay. Furthermore, uh, once you join the queue, you can share that information with your friends on your various social platforms, such as Facebook, Twitter, uh, and whatnot. And uh, we track how much traffic you bring back to the Pineapple application with that, that link that you shared. And uh, we rank people based on how many people that actually brought back to the website. And uh, we have a, a, a bunch of exciting prizes that we're, we're going to hand out to people who spread the word um, the most. So I will firstly say to you, your listeners, uh, join the e access queue. It's be found at pineapple.co.za. Once the application is um, available, uh, we will let you guys know about the application. You'll be the first few individuals to get access to the application and you can start it sharing away. Okay, fantastic. Just to, just to touch on that, um, just to answer your question on how you get insurance on Pineapple. So that's one of the things that we, we really try to minimize the steps on what is required to get insurance. We're not going to ask you a thousand questions. We're not going to need a urine sample or DNA test. We do, it will be a very, very seamless process. You'll be able to get insurance in minutes, if not seconds. Okay, fantastic. No, guys, I must say, I'm very, very excited for this technology and I'm going to be wishing you all the best. I must say, I do want to apologize. Yeah, the audio quality hasn't been the best, but I'll put on a little, like, you know, the, the subtitles at the bottom just to make sure that everyone can follow along. But just want to say, yeah, thanks again for your time and all the best, eh? Thanks a lot, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Pleasure. Cheers, guys. Bye. Cheers.